really appreciate it. I love stress. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. yeah. Recitation is not working. Okay. All right. So this is uh, this is why being resilient is a good thing, right? You can't yeah. be folding under stress. All right. So my name is Kathleen DiChiara. Um, show of hands. Anybody remember me from last year? All right. And you came back. This is good. <laughs> Um, so if you want to hear a little bit about my personal story, you'll have to come to the showing after lunch. I will be doing an uh, excerpt from the uh, documentary film Secret Ingredients, and my story of recovery is featured in that film, so you can learn a little bit more about um, why I've been into the field of nutrition. Um, so I encourage you to do that. I think that would be um, something that everyone will really enjoy. In the audience is Amy Hart, who is the film, one of the film producers and directors, so she will be answering questions as well. Um, my current uh, career now as a result of my personal story is uh, I'm a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner, and uh, I have lots of other mm -hmm. things that I do. I'm like, a um, certified chef and um, started out as a health coach originally, and then got lots of other certifications. Um, and I have a private practice in Rhode Island, although I work with people all over the world. Um, but I do a lot of nutritional consulting for medical doctors, so people who have complex cases and then don't necessarily understand the nutritional aspects of um, the chronic disease. And so they bring their complex cases to me and then I look at the nutritional compounds um, or nutritional aspects of that. For so, those of us not here last year, what was your personal story in the nutshell? My personal story was that I was a corporate executive for a Fortune 500 doing investor relations. I did recreational tri triathlons on the weekends. My husband and I were very healthy or healthy living. We thought we were doing all the right things, and I ended up developing sudden onset neuropathy in my legs. I underwent back surgery and woke up with post-operative paralysis. And I was put on permanent disability for life at age 35 and told I would never recover. Well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, that was spiraled into a multitude of chronic diseases, and I got worse and worse and worse, and then ultimately used food uh, to heal myself. So, so thank you for that. And uh, I've gotten really good at wrapping up in a nutshell. <laughs> Um, so I think before we get into the why uh, we are going to talk about biochemical pathways and the microbiome and all the things that are important, I think it's important to talk about really the crisis that we all face in terms of chronic disease. Because I think what's really important to think about is that chronic disease is not only the most common and costly of all diseases, but it is preventable. So it's really staggering for us to think about that seven out of 10 deaths are related to chronic disease and yet it is preventable. Um, the statistics really are staggering and um, it's a very difficult thing I think for us to face as a nation financially, but um, it is affecting all of us, right? It is our family, it is our employees, uh, it is us. Uh, we are all faced with chronic disease. Even myself, a very young woman in her 30s, who was doing all the right things fell into the category of a woman with chronic debilitating disease, fully disabled, on Social Security, getting a Social Security check for life. Um, so I fell quickly into that system of somebody who was not able to care for herself or her family. And I just think that it's very easy for us to think of that of chronic disease or the system is full of people who are not caring for themselves or are just um, maybe abusing themselves or eating a poor diet um, and that they're just doing all of the wrong things. But I was doing all of the right things and I was right into that system just like that, right? And so it is a huge epidemic and it is affecting all of us. And so we have to really start to ask some tough questions about ourselves, about what is it that is going to change this and I think that the biggest uh, reality for me was that I didn't have any of the information I needed to get well. And even when I asked questions about how could I help myself, there were no answers. The conventional model doesn't have the answers. Even if they wanted to give me the answers, they didn't have the answers to right. give me. They weren't trained to give me the answers. And they are also frustrated, okay? So they also are victims to the same 
problem. So everybody is feeling the same level of frustration. Um, I think in order for anyone to heal personally and for us to heal globally, it's very, very critical that we understand that consciousness is a critical element of that. We have to recognize our sense of self and then our connection with others. Just like Dan talks about that this is an interconnected web and that when we talk about soil health and the biology of us, this interconnected link between the microorganisms in the soil and how we're going to heal the health of the soil and therefore the planet and the quality of the food, the only way that you can really, really recognize the importance of how that's going to happen is to be conscious of the, the, the broader impact of that to health of the planet and each other and yourself, okay? Because each one of us has to remember that we are, there are seven billion people in the world, but that's seven billion souls and we're all here for a greater purpose. And yet most people are walking around trying to figure out how to recover from an illness, prevent an illness, get better from some, some type of sickness that they have. Very few people get up in the morning and live out their life purpose. They're actually trying to get healthy enough so that they can have a better quality life. So very few people are healthy enough that they actually are living a really great life, that health is actually something that comes very naturally to them. They're, they're actually operating in that rhythm all the time, right? right. So it's this constant thing of managing chronic disease. <coughs> Most people are managing their health on a daily basis. They're either taking a drug or an over-the-counter or a pharmaceutical or a supplement or doing a holistic remedy to feel well enough to either do their job or get better enough so they can have a healthy life. And it's very hard for me to find healthy people to run, run lab tests on. I'm like, I need healthy microbiome. Does anybody know anybody that doesn't have symptoms, chronic disease, anybody? <laughs> it's really hard to find people who are symptom-free and thriving, right? It's very, very difficult. Um, so from a functional standpoint, a lot of people ask me what's the difference between functional nutrition, clinical nutrition, and registered dietitians. Um, there's a big difference. So functional nutrition really looks at optimal operations in the body. So the systems of the body, how they're meant to be working together, and that everything is interconnected. So generally speaking, <clears throat> clinical um, nutrition looks really more at uh, clinical findings and uses symptoms uh, to do disease diagnostics. Uh, functional nutrition looks at those systems of the body and how they should be operating effectively and how to correct those imbalances so that the body works correctly and smoothly so there are no symptoms. So symptoms being the language of the body and then recognizing when there are no symptoms that the body is working um, at its optimal level. So we use that, that information and that data to, uh, to bring clarity to the body. Now generally, I'm putting things in buckets. We try not to compartmentalize the body, but certainly from a clinical standpoint, uh, it's helpful for us to help the patient or the client really uh, move through healing if we can help target very specific areas. Generally, these are the categories that biochemical imbalances show up as, you know, brain inflammation, digestive disorders, liver dysfunction, poor detoxification, compromised immune system, mitochondrial disorders, and then endocrine disruption um, and neurotransmitter imbalances. This is another way of looking at the same thing. Um, so you can see the systems, and then they sort of report up to neurological, and then also back down. And then each one has subcategories um, that that fall you know, into each of those bubbles, and then they also cross each other. So digestion and in immune, sort of, I would say, are probably the two most closely linked. <coughs> Anything operating digestion and immunological are really going to be one and the same. So we would really consider that. Uh, or I would consider digestion and immune as one, and I would wrap the microbiome around that as one unit. Um, that shouldn't look like that. Uh, so um, <laughs> so uh, this really, again, is 
another thing for us to think about in terms of your own health, uh, that the condition of the person who has the disease is more important than what the disease is, okay? So we are in uh, an age now where people love to label, um, and people come to my practice with lots of labels. Um, this is also very prevalent because of Google, um, and so people love to use bullets and charts and things to self-diagnose what they have. Um, and this can be um, very dangerous because oftentimes people are then also self-treating. So they think they have fungal overgrowths and they put themselves on cleanses to clean out um, what they perceive to be an candida overgrowth or a yeast overgrowth or small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. And really what they had was low stomach acid or a stress trigger that actually slowed motility. And then what they did by taking that cleanse and cleaning out what very little fungus they had and should still have but no longer have, <laughs> is they've actually changed the diversity of the microbiome and now they have a whole nother set of symptoms and now they're actually worse than they were in the first place because they thought they had something that they didn't and now they don't now they have another set of problems but they've labeled themselves as a candida or a fungal overgrowth candidate or somebody that has a very specific condition and so this pattern of labeling and systemic, and then, and then they might also then develop another co-infection, and then they might further get a diagnosis of somebody that has Lyme or somebody that has, and so this pattern goes on. And generally the people that come to me are referred by a medical doctor or other specialists, or they've been to other nutritionists who can't help them. And so they, two or three years, they're actually very complex cases, so they have multiple diagnoses and spreadsheets with supplements and lots of specialized and restrictive diets. And uh, so we have to go through the unlabeling, what we call the bumper stickers off, mm -hmm. so we can really get to the root of what it is that's actually happening inside the body. So the most important thing for you to be thinking about with your own health is not necessarily, I understand that the disease um, can help to really help you recognize the suffering. I get that. I get that when you, when somebody tells you you have a very specific condition, that that is, um, really justifies the suffering sometimes. And it can make you feel heard, right? That you've been suffering a long time and finally somebody sees you, they hear you, and they recognize that yes, there is a very real thing. So I'm not in any way suggesting that you have to put your label up on shelf and that there, there isn't such a thing and that it's all in your head. But what I am suggesting is that it's more important for you to understand the health of the host and that inner terrain is far superior because that's really why the disease happened. Okay? The condition of the host is why the disease took hold. And if you can get to that, then that's the sweet spot. Because the condition is just describing a set of symptoms that happened as a result of the previous conditions. And that's what has to change. So if you can change those previous conditions and get the health of the host to be resilient, then the condition that's present will no longer be there. Now it may be different, or you may have things that you can't change. So I'll explain that as we go through, but I want you to start shifting your thinking and getting away from the diagnostic labels. Those are distractions, they lead to protocols, they distract the clinician, they keep people stuck in, oh, this is what we do for autism, this is what we do for cognitive deficiencies, this is what we do for fibromyalgia, okay? That's a distraction, okay? And it's not because the way that I'm gonna heal this particular person with that condition is extremely different than what I'm gonna do for somebody else who has the same exact condition, totally different. Okay? And, if, and if I have a set of criteria and a protocol for a condition, I'm not going to get anywhere. And that's why people spin their wheels year after year after year. Oh, I'm doing the such and such diet. I'm doing the diet for such and such because that's what's supposed to work for this person. And it never works. And that's why people suffer. Yeah. So we're going to talk about the hidden 
So does everybody in the room know that we are 90%? Oh, bacteria! Actually, maybe even less human. So we have, we're really just a bacterial organism in a human body. Okay, they're using us to get around. We thought it was the other way around. Human body carrying microorganisms. Wrong. They're using us. Wrong to move around. Okay, and they so ten times microbial, right? And they have we only have twenty thousand human genes. But our microbes have trillions of genes, 3 million genes, so 150 times the human genome. So when they say like, oh, such and such a disease runs in my family, right? Because you're talking about this little pathetic 20,000 genome. <laughs> you go, okay, well, I have 100 trillion microbes and they have 3 million genes. So do you want this to be your focus or do you want to work with them? I'm working with them. I'm like, well, what can you do? Because these guys are doing nothing. I like that. So this is the focus, right? That you can use those microbes to your benefit. They're a living organism. They're, they're there really for our benefit. They want to survive. They want you to survive. If you don't survive, they don't have anywhere to live. Right? So there's no point in you not carrying on because then they have to find another host. This is a map of the diversity of the human microbiome. I know it's too small and I'm not expecting you to be able to read that, but the point of the slide is really to make that, uh, from a clinical standpoint, my love <coughs> is to look at patterns of disease and then look at the uh, where we, are, our understanding of where the microbes are living. Are they living in the nose, the vagina, the placenta? Uh, what do they like to do there? What are they eating? Uh, what is their behavior like? And then in the clinical setting, what's happening in the diseases? Who's getting the allergies? Who's recovering? What is the disease pathology of certain conditions? Are those microbes responsible? Do, what's their active role? When people don't have specific types of bacteria, are they more prevalent in getting certain types of arthritis? Do they have higher rates of allergies? Do they have higher rates of disease conditions? And so can we bring, bridge the gap between those two things and so we can have better clinical outcomes by saying, are these types of microbes more helpful? You know, are there certain things? So it was an interesting study where they looked at little children who pick their nose and eat the cookies. And there's so certain types of streptococcus in the nose. And I'm like, of course they're eating this. They're trying to clear their streptococcus. But, you know, and I sent it to all the pediatricians. And I was like, stop telling all the little kids to stop picking their nose. They know what they're doing, you know? And I had one pediatrician who was like, I knew it. I knew it. I was like, see? It's like human nature. And my little son used to do it like intentionally. Like he'd turn around at church and do it in front of the old lady. And out. You know, like, like rub it in, you know? And we're like, oh, this is so humiliating. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, so yeah, you know, there's these organisms living in certain places, but they have this protective component, right? They have this ability to protect us from certain types of viruses. And we have to stop thinking of them as bad guys because they really are there for very specific reasons. And it's our own ignorance that we think they're a problem. We keep trying to get rid of them instead of saying, well, gee, why are they there in the first place? Right? Maybe we should just stop and ask that question. And so that's the role that I play. I say, well, if certain types of diseases are more prone to having certain types of bacteria overgrow, why don't we stop blaming the bacteria and ask the more important question, which is, well, why are they overgrowing with that particular type of bacteria? Is the bacteria trying to help? Right? So, and this is true in the autism community tend to be very overgrown with fungus, right? So there's a lot of antifungal approaches in autism. I found that interesting. I thought, well, maybe the fungus is actually trying to do something, mm -hmm. right? Nobody's asking, is the fungus trying to declare something? 
everyone's trying to kill the fungus. So what do they do after the fungus gets cleared? It comes back. Even more. So there's the potential that maybe the fungus is trying to clean up a toxin in the body. And so we have to start getting more curious that the body and the, the microorganisms are smarter than we are. And that we have to ask really important questions about why something might potentially be overgrowing. And then think about, yes, there are certain times that we do have to get certain types of bacteria to get under control because they can be very aggressive and very dangerous. So certainly we have to know what our boundaries are. But we don't know that a lot. So our view of, of bacteria microorganisms, of course, used to be in the past that they were benign or dangerous. It was one or the other, um, causing illness or disease. And then today we understand they're more credited as being instrumental, extracting food nutrients in our digestive tract, developing organ systems, regulating blood pressure, producing B vitamins, vitamin K, training our immune system, so modulating our immune system. So we have a better understanding of their role. I would say uh, we have even a greater understanding of our ecology in the sense that we understand our commensal bacteria, and by commensal I mean our gut bacteria, or what people call our good or friendly bacteria. Uh, another way of thinking of them is our co-partners are eating at the same table. So you eat your food, you feed your body, but you also feed your commensal bacteria living in and on us. And that they normally don't produce infections under good conditions, previously thought to be neutral. I would argue that we've even evolved from that to understand them as being more mutualistic. So mutualistic meaning uh, we're not only just feeding and co-eating with them, but that there's a, certainly a direct benefit. So the best example of that would be that um, you eat a fiber-rich food, it moves its way through the stomach, to the small intestine. By the time it gets to the top of the colon, uh, the fiber is digested and uh, produces a short-chain fatty acid called butyrate. The butyrate then produces a secondary product of uh, feet, propionate, and then acetate. Those short-chain fatty acids release, so when the bacteria eat the fiber, they produce short chain fatty acids. And then there's a mucosal release that then repairs your small intestine. So there is a, a gift that they give back when we give them fiber, which is that they secrete a mucus that then repairs the small intestine. So when we don't eat fibrous food, and we don't allow them to chew and chew those fibers, we don't really allow that mucosal repair. Okay, so there's this really important process that chewing and eating real food is so critical to a healthy microbiome. Uh, but that is that mutualistic. There is that exchange, that giving back. Mm -hmm. You give me food to eat, I'm going to do something else, and I'm also going to give a secondary byproduct to other types of bacteria. Okay, and then I'll take this to a third level, which I'll get into later, which is the role that certain types of bacteria have in destabilizing biofilm production. So commensal bacteria breaking down biofilm that then protects it, that builds around um, pathogens and certain types of infections. So when people end up getting Lyme infections or fungal infections that then build biofilm and they can't get well, that certain types of commensal bacteria will break down that biofilm and foods as well, and also play an active role in quorum sensing, which is how bacteria communicate with each other. So people are noticing quorum sensing. So three key pathway activations that I want to talk about as it relates to uh, the microbiome and biochemical pathways is the nervous system, immune system, and endocrine. <coughs> um, I'm not going to get into heavy detail on any one of these because we could spend an entire day just talking about one, but this is just really to open up the conversation to invite you to start thinking more about how the microorganisms and the food and how they might be moving throughout the body and start to think about how we might be initiating healing. So the parasympathetic nervous system, uh, are people familiar with the parasympathetic nervous system, the vagus nerve? Um, this is you know, part of our nourish and rest, our fight and flight, right? So people hear a lot about this. In particular, the cranial nerve 10, which is here, 
So this is right here coming down to your neck. You can see this is your cranial, this is your vagus nerve, which is part of your parasympathetic nervous system. Um, and you can see it's hitting every vital organ. Mm -hmm. Okay? So this is so critical <coughs> right here. All right? That this little, all these fibers, filters, these little fibers are running and they are all connecting to all of your vital organs. Right? And those fibers that are traveling through the vagus nerve also have bacteria that are carrying information up to the brain. Okay? Think of it like a bi directional superhighway. All right, so I just want you to have that vision. And then we also have the lower organs here, the bladder, kidneys, rectum, large intestine as well. Okay, so everything being interconnected. So this is serving as the involuntary nervous system for the heart rate, increased intestinal glandular activity um, through part of your entire nervous system which I think is such a huge area right now. I think the entire world has a dysfunction of the central nervous system. <laughs> I really do. I think that is a major, major problem currently. I think with electromagnetic radiation, viruses, poor sleep, stress, shitty food, vaccines, everything, toxins, yeah, everything that's stupid, that is just bombarding the immune system, I think, is just uh, wreaking havoc. So this is a closer look <clears throat> at the vagus nerve and the interconnection. And I think it's really fascinating. Um, this is looking at the book up my throat, lactobacillus rhamnosus, showing to decrease depression-like behavior, but it had no effect on the vagus nerve was severed. So really relied on that interconnection of the vagus nerve to the brain. So that particular probiotic <laughs> or that particular strain of bacteria was really using uh, the vagus nerve as a transportation, uh, but it was really relying on and behaving, uh, you know, using the depression like behavior. And so uh, this is just such an important um, pathway for us to be thinking about and how we might be able to be using certain types of bacteria as a way to regulate that. This is just to take a look at um, uh, the interest that they're looking at in sports medicine and how athletes are um, performing or not performing or having negative, um, more uh, poor outcomes in terms of mood dysregulation that's being induced through exercise. And that was this particular study looked at bacteria connecting to the brain via the veins, nervous influencing behavior during exercise because of subproducts that gain access um, using neural <coughs> pathways. So again, there's no, the research is really looking at everything. In other words, they used to think, oh, the runner's high, you've heard about that. Is it you know, certain neurotransmitter chemicals or people getting a lot of adrenaline? Um, but they're now looking at, is it the microbiome? Do they have certain types of species of bacteria in the gut? Is that really influencing performance, recovery, uh, mood stabilization? Are those people able to um, perform better before and after? So it's it's the microbiome, I think, is really driving that neurotransmitter behavior more than they thought the neurotransmitters in itself. And you know, is the uh, exercise the stressor? And then how, what does that recovery look like? Uh, so this is the vagus nerve specifically to rest and nourishment. Um, but again, it talks about the fibers that parasympathetic fibers sending information. Um, so 80, so this is good, the statistic of 80 to 90% of those fibers really are responsible for sending information to the org, from the organs back to the primitive areas of the brain. So it really, that fiber that I was talking about in the parasympathetic system is taking information, for example, from the lungs <coughs> and then sending information back to the brain and then asking the vagus nerve to respond accordingly. In other words, secrete mucus because the lungs are inflamed, uh, or it's changed, looking at changes in the weather pattern, or it's looking at specific information in the body and then saying you need to contract certain muscles or there are specific issues. So it's constantly reading the, the response and the information that's happening in the body. You're doing nothing other than subjecting yourself to unpleasant circumstances at all times. And then it's reading that information and then responding accordingly, right? So this is constant feedback that is happening all of the time. 
And so the question is, are you building the body that is has everything it needs to deal with all of that information, right? Or are you just abusing the body and giving it no good raw material so that when that information goes up and says the lungs are congested and it tells the, tells the brain that there's congestion there, but there's nothing for it to work with. There are no commensal bacteria, right? There's no lactoamnosis, there's no bacteria, there's no commensal bacteria, there's sort of like no team members on staff to make that assist, right? That's the way you have to think of it. You really need these co-partners, you need all of these things because the systems are going to send the information back and forth. But if you don't have anything to work with, then you have suffering, right? You get the symptoms like not with nothing here, nothing here. I don't, I don't have anything to deal with, and so the body sort of breaks down. Okay. So this again, I'm going to move on to the immune system, but I just want to touch on the vagus nerve as it relates to viral infections. I'm trying not to get through like my eyes closed or talk. <laughs> <laughs> Every picture be on like. So that one looks like I never gave a lecture ever. Yeah, it's all been like this. <laughs> yeah, or any, right? You know? Yeah. Uh, so this particular one was really interesting because at the time I was looking at this theory, and this was related to the herpes virus as a trigger on the vagus nerve. And it, I thought this was really fascinating because this was related to chronic, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. And chronic fatigue syndrome, if you know anybody that's had it, I had it, is unbelievable. It's, it's indescribable, okay? It's not tired, it's not exhaustion, it's driving to the store and then thinking about going in the store and weeping in the car because the idea of going in the store is unbearable. That's how bad it was. And you've already slept nine hours. But it's an overly consuming, it consumes your entire body because nothing is working. It's literally like every cell in your body has given out. And you have nothing to work with. And this was so fascinating to me because I understood that uh, herpetic viruses were dormant. We all have them. By age 6, 70% of the population have herpetic viruses. By teenage years, 95%. And by young adulthood, everyone has them. So we all have them. Epstein-Barr, CMV, HH6, HHJ, HH12. We all have them, and they live in our central nervous system that we just looked at. And then they become dormant, and they get reactivated under stressful conditions. They sit in lymphatic tissue, they sit in the central nervous system, and then they become dormant and latent and reactivated. Well, I had already just had surgery, right? Which was very traumatic. And so uh, it made sense to me that I, that would have reactivated the dormant viral activity, <coughs> and that that would have potentially triggered a chronic fatigue syndrome. Now I was on morphine, and my liver was shot, and I had been subjected to all kinds of trauma, and so this made sense to me. So I thought, well, if I have a virus active in the body, why don't I try to suppress it using food? And I did. And it worked. And I was fascinated at this idea, and so I started to do antiviral foods with my son. And he had 25 to 30 warts on his body, little viral warts, mm -hmm. and they disappeared. Mm -hmm. And I thought, aha. So it was, again, fascinating to me that I could see small changes, you know, as we were experimenting, that the body was responding to this mindset of, oh, okay, there are viruses and that we have control, that we can do things for ourselves, and that this can be part of that healing process. You know, I don't have to go to the rainforest and get a special teacher. <laughs> I can just do it in my own yard with real food. Um, so this is modulating the immune system uh, that we're gonna talk about, which is that second stage, I think, or that second piece of, act, of activation that I'm looking at. Um, and this is using uh, specific microbes that really modulate the immune system. So um, in this example, I'm thinking more about missing certain microbes. Bacteroides fragilis is one that modulates the immune system and is more likely uh, linked to uh, preventing excessive inflammation in the body. And we're seeing this as uh, 
uh, bacteria that's missing. Uh, and when we have an abundance of this type of bacteria, um, we basically are less likely to have inflammation. And an absence of bacteria, <coughs> fragilis, is linked to autoimmune conditions, Crohn's, type 1 diabetes, autism, multiple sclerosis. So it has some protective components. And I think it's important for us to be thinking about that. In this particular example, this is Bacteroides fragilis using T regulatory cells as a protection against demyelination um, for MS. So it has some protective components against the demyelination of the central nervous system as it relates to the MS. <coughs> are you pioneering these theories or are you simply articulating them? Well? I'm reporting, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm not pioneering these studies, no. Maybe I will. Yeah. I'm not, these I'm reporting on. Give me time. So this is H. pylori. Helicopactic pylori is well known for its uh, association with stomach ulcers, uh, gastric ulcers, duodenal ulcers. So it has a bad rap. Um, has anybody read Martin Glacier's book, Missing Microbes? Fascinating book, you should read that. Um, he looked at H. pylori um, in the light of what it can do for us versus um, how bad it is. And H. pylori is something that we all need, and we certainly don't want too much of it, but we don't necessarily want none of it. And what we're beginning to understand is that when we hand down these types of microbes, this is generally in the stomach, H. pylori tends to uh, be a stomach bacteria, uh, we often can hand those down to the next generation and reduce their risk of having autoimmune conditions. Now, I had mine eradicated at age 16 because I had a duodenal ulcer at age 16. And so I had mine um, treated with antibiotics and I didn't have a duodenal ulcer. But then I later developed autoimmune disease and then I ended up with a child with a spectrum. So it's interesting for me to see that potentially I got rid of some of those protective things, and had I known then what I knew now, would I have tried to do something different in terms of killing it as opposed to controlling it or bringing it back into balance? <coughs> so it was clear that you know it took control and it was creating a problem that was burning the esophagus, and obviously it wouldn't have wanted that to continue or it would have led to stomach cancer but perhaps with a better understanding, the treatment approach would be different. Um, so now I test for H. pylori um, in my lab tests um, on my own uh, clients to see whether or not they have it. So it, it certainly we want to look at the benefits and we want to understand the risks, but then we also want to understand its role um, in the long term. So here we're going to talk a little bit more about the chronic hepatic viruses that I mentioned. And I think the important thing to think about is, again, that we all have them and not to be afraid of them, but to recognize that they are latent and reoccurring and that they, that's their nature, okay? And the important question to ask for yourself is, are they active or dormant? And that they love to co-mingle with other infections. So like all microorganisms in nature and in soil, they don't work in isolation, they work as a community. So viruses like to co-mingle with other bacteria, um, Epstein-Barr virus like to commingle with certain caucus, with certain types of bacteria that we like that tend to buddy up with each other. And so sometimes people will catch a common cold or get sick, and then that can often reemerge a hepatic virus or bring another virus, virus up to the system. And if you understand and start to recognize what it looks like or what it feels like, people who tend to get lymphatic um, or they, they say, well, I feel like my lymph nodes are swollen or sore, or I'm getting a sore throat, or my, I have this earache or ear pain, or I feel like I have a ringing in my ear, or I feel like I have nerve pain or headache, or I'm getting dizzy, my equilibrium is off. Those are a lot of viral issues, and when you recognize them and you know what to do, uh, then you can push them right back into a dormant state, and they usually don't become anything. A lot of times people don't know how to recognize them or treat them themselves, and then they mask them, or they don't do anything, and then they snowball into other problems. 
So I think it's very empowering to recognize what these types of viruses and bacteria look and feel like, not to be afraid of them, to recognize them as part of you, and then to feel in control that there's always something that you can do. It's just an organism. Uh, it's, it's not, you know, that you, there's lots of techniques and, and natural things that you can do for yourself. And that food is one of those amazing and beautiful things that we have available to us. And they like certain foods um, and they don't like other things. They tend not to like plants, right? Because they have a lot of phytonutrients and compound chemicals in them that um, make them uncomfortable. And so you just bring a lot of those foods back in. So in my gut healing lecture on Thursday, I talk a lot about how to do that. Um, this is an example. This is a, a live cycle of Epstein Barr virus. And this, see this cell right here? This is the B cell. And this is where the Epstein Barr likes to piggyback on your naive B cells. So when your B cells are not busy, a lot of the ones that are not occupied doing anything, the naive ones they call, uh, that's where it rides its way. Okay? And that's how it moves throughout the body. So, we know what these viruses are doing and how they're moving around throughout the body. And so it's just, again, important for us to recognize uh, how they're moving around and how they're reacting throughout the body, and then again, how we can access them. Uh, this is another immunological interesting um, piece. This is autoantibodies and autism in the brain. This was a study done on the association between IgG antibodies against the measles virus in the brain, um, which was induced an auto, autoimmune response in this active role in autism. So we know that the immune system is recognizing certain types of viruses, or like hepatic viruses or the measles virus, <coughs> And that it's often tagging those viruses and then forming um, immune responses to them. So again, when we have a better understanding of why this is happening and what's happening, really getting that key information is the first step. Because if we don't understand what's happening, it's hard for us to take an active role and to really make a clinical decision um, and to drive better clinical outcomes without a full understanding of what it is that we're dealing with. So I think it's, it's really interesting for us to have an open mind about what's happening. Um, this is an endocrine system activation, which is the third. And this is uh, the biochemical uh, neurotransmitters. So many people think of the neurotransmitters as uh, brain chemicals. They're actually endocrine chemicals. Our endocrine system is part of our hormonal system. And that's me. So even just there, you have three different types of bacteria making serotonin, right? So people, you'll hear that um, comment now, 70% of the serotonin in your brain is made in the gut. So you can see that there are um, different types of bacteria that are responsible for doing that. So what if you don't have those strains of bacteria? And you don't have serotonin production, right? And so then how do you think your mood is going to be? Tanked, right? So then you get ADHD medication or antidepressants, right? And what do you think that does? Makes my body better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have one? Good. <laughs> 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 Meet you in the hall. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's why I give lectures in Colorado. No. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think it's really important. So I do lab tests now. I do DNA lab tests in school cultures, and it's very interesting to look at people's microbiome and then look at certainly the clinical outcomes and clinical findings. So people who are more prone to depression, anxiety, social, emotional behavior, very rarely do you find people with lactobacillus anymore. Other than no yogurt, what's it for salt? Well, most people are on dairy-free diets, so that's one problem. And then even if you're getting uh, taking in lactobacillus, um, you know, even if you're taking in dairy, it's still a good source in terms of building lactobacillus. So I think it's different than a lot of times people think that they can re-inoculate um, their microbiome by taking in, you 
know, a supermarket yogurt, which is not true. Uh, fermented food is certainly <coughs> superior in terms of rebuilding um, black cell bacteria. But I think in terms of just in general, the general population, you have to have diversity to have all of the microbes, you know. Um, I think the main problem is that people are doing high doses of probiotics now, and they're getting monocultures. Mm -hmm. So what we see is that um, people are taking like, you know, bifidobacteroides and taking high strains of um, probiotics that can be somewhat helpful, maybe following a round of antibiotics, but they're taking it because that's what they read in the magazine or because that's what they're told is how you, you know, have a healthy body now is to take a supplement and it's creating what we see as an isolated um, mono, you could call it monocrop of the ecosystem. And it isn't diverse and um, they're certainly not feeding the microbes the right foods. So there's so much imbalance. There's very little um, fungus, uh, like not like not even detectable. So, and no parasites, which you need a little bit of. So you need a little bit of everything. And so people, it's a very interesting thing when you actually start to look that um, if you were just to look at the labs, you would think that the people who have some of the parasites and pathogens and some of the fungus would be your sickest population, but the people that are the sickest are the sterile ones. So they have no parasites, no autoimmune pathogens, um, no fungus, uh, undetectable. I mean, they don't have any amounts at all. And again, tomorrow I'll show some examples of labs um, right on the screen and show you what they look like. So diversity is the key, it's the amount. You don't want too many of them and you need balance. And so in order to get that balance, you have to have the other types of commensal bacteria to work with that. So in this particular example, I'm just pointing out that our bacteria are really making our brain chemicals and we need to rely on those microbes to really build those neurotransmitters in the brain. And even histamine, there's so many people have histamine problems and not breaking down um, histamine, and that's a bacterial problem. So the bacteria are really methylating histamine. And so you can use a low histamine diet temporarily, or you can take an antihistamine if you have histamine reaction. But really the bigger question is why are you having a histamine reaction? And so the long-term possibility would be to explore, are you missing specific types of microbes that are not actually there to break down and clean up some of those histamines? So we look at that temporarily, there's always certain things you can do. You can take uh, calcium citrate to bind to the histamine and take it out through the urine. I mean, therapeutically, there's lots of things we can do and we can shortcut that, you know, for a couple of weeks, fix the problem, you know, rectify that. But if you don't have somebody <coughs> to help you correct that and you just stay on a low histamine diet or take antihistamines for the rest of your life, you're really just managing chronic disease. <laughs> using remedies and solutions, but the same problem is still there, okay? So this is anxiety and social behavior. This was a study in 2013, and it looked at autism-like behavior in mice, and what they did was they um, subjected the mice to Bacteroides fragilis, and the mice became um, less anxious and more social. So they were actually, you know, Make, taking the bacteria's fragilis out of them and then putting it back in so they were regulating that behavior. But again, they also looked at it, its use in correcting gut permeability um, and then uh, its ability to alter communication and anxiety like and sensory motor behavior. What was the source of that? So you can't get bacteria's fragilis in a source, you have to feed. And that's true for a lot of the best microbes. You, you can't source them, like get it in a bottle. You can't get H. pylori, or you can't, you know. You create the habitat. That's right, exactly. And I'll talk about that. Um, so my alt, and eventually that may not actually, there probably are some sources in terms of where you can get them in the soil and other types of places, but again, that's not the problem that we're talking about. Um, so mind-altering microbes, this is just over-encompassing of endocrine, um, nervous system, and, and endocrine, okay? 
So our nervous system, endocrine, and brain. <coughs> the brain microbiome. So this is all of those things, cortisol, cytokines, vagus nerve, all of the pathways together, really using that entire gut brain axis. So it's sort of encompassing the whole thing and thinking about that bio-directional pathway. These are the diseases and conditions associated with dysbiosis. This is just a partial list. Um, this particular study looked at all of them, but you can see, of course, um, you know, these conditions are, um, you know, this is something that we all kind of appreciate or we know somebody that is dealing with um, all of these conditions, allergies, asthma, celiac disease, IBS, IBD, skin conditions, psoriasis, fungal overgrowth, pancreatic insufficiency, alcoholism, diabetes, autism, brain and nervous disorders, depression. Um, you can pull up any disease microbiome and and anything comes up. Acne, heart disease, obesity, autism. I mean, they're doing research on everything as it relates to the microbiome. Now, some things are further along than others. Um, certainly, you know, there's some conditions that they've found some really interesting findings and others are much further behind. I think that it's... Um, we're still very far away from having any significant clinical findings on what it is that we can do with this information and how we can really change. And I think a lot of the research really goes to creating pills <coughs> and pharmaceutical drugs um, and isolating these certain microbes so that they can monetize um, you know, products so that people can ultimately um, capitalize on <coughs> whatever the disease of the of lung is. I think what's important for you as a consumer is to recognize that the more that we learn about this, the more um, empowered you should feel that there are things that you can do to care for yourself and to care for your organisms um, in a way that allows you to be completely in control of your health. And it's just so critical for you to understand that if you think of yourself as an organism, and you think of yourself as this constantly changing, that you're never the same, that just being at this conference and being around all these other people, you've just exchanged organisms with everybody here. This is a good audience to come to. <laughs> There's some conferences you don't want to go to. <laughs> so this is good, you know, getting to know people that you think look healthy. <laughs> and, um, and so the biggest question people always ask me is, you know, can you supplement your way to a healthy microbiome? Everyone wants to know if there's a supplement. If there's a microbiome. And literally everybody wants to know. And I have a lot of supplements because I used to take the same thing. Um, and you know, it's, you know. Uh, yeah, no. Yeah, it's, there is no supplement on the market that's going to change your microbiome. It's not going to happen. The research um, on supplements is interesting. Uh, I listened to some really intense research last year uh, on lab studying probiotics, and very few probiotics, the therapeutic grade, not the stuff that you're getting at the supermarket, the therapeutic grade probiotics, um, are actually even making it down to the pole. So maybe one to two strains if you're lucky. And um, that's if they can survive the stomach acid. And very few even have what they say are in them. And then the, you hope that the ones that actually make it down to the colon are the ones you need in the first place. So um, there are very specific instances where probiotic therapy is very helpful. Um, and so you can keep that in mind that using it therapeutically is a great thing. But if you think that taking the probiotic in the fridge and you're got it recovered, um, that's where you kind of let yourself down. So this is an example of people getting recurrent tonsillitis, it's like strep throat. And this is a strain of bacteria called Salivaris K12, which is a chewable bacteria that changes the bacteria in the mouth. And it's really pretty good um, clinical changes, so uh, reduction in episodes by greater than 90%, and uh, a decrease in incident by 80% of viral infections in the strep department. So it's remembering that strep throat is usually viral, not bacterial. 
So this is a really interesting um, one that is very easy to experiment with because it's, it's easy to find and you can just get it as a chewable, uh, no harm, no done. So you're changing the bacteria of the mouth, uh, which actually is very similar to the bacteria of the placenta. Um, that's one of those random fun facts that you don't know why it's stored in your brain, but you just say it anyway. Um, so this is research that was done on probiotic supplementation um, as it relates to Alzheimer's, and it was looking at functional and metabolic status of patients. So 60 adults with confirmed Alzheimer's disease, placebo versus probiotic, 12 weeks. They took a blend of lactobacillus acidophilus, lactobacillus casein, <coughs> bactrim bifidum, and lactobacillus fermentum. And the interesting thing about this is, so this is, I'm highlighting the two groups, so I read the research. Low, the, the group that took the probiotic had lower CRP, which is a marker of inflammation. They had a higher glutathione, which is our master antioxidant. Okay, so that's actually really good. Uh, dramatic improvement in beta cell function, so the pancreatic function improved, and they had improved cognitive function. But the interesting part of this research was the people in the placebo got worse. So they actually had a, so they didn't just stay the same, they actually had a higher marker of inflammation, lower glutathione, okay, no change in beta cell function and a decline in cognitive function. So they actually continued to get worse. They had a decrease in their master antioxidant, okay, and they had an increase in inflammation while the people in the probiotic improved in all areas. So that's pretty significant. Now these are people with confirmed Alzheimer's and so we see that the probiotics are actively improving those conditions, right, and slowing that inflammation and helping the cognitive decline. So that's a really um, helpful and support. Now, would you do that if would you give the probiotic with those strains to somebody in your family who had Alzheimer's? I'm not sure. Right? I would. I, I keep concocting special yogurt and bringing it into this, my mom in the nursing home and saying that it's a special function. Um, so these are other types of strains that we see, um, and I put their food source, the kimchi, sauerkraut, fermented dairy products, pickles, found in us at birth, naturally present in breast milk or the vagina, um, and so where you can get them. And so, and then what their clinical role is, um, or where, where they've been studied, certainly. Now we can't make claims, and so you can't find a probiotic that's going to be able to make these claims. These are... Um, what they're being studied, um, and what the clinical findings are, um, but you can't make the correlation and say that lactobacillus plantarum, you know, reduces inflammation. So I'm just telling you what the clinical findings are, what the reports are. So we know that it is fighting fungus and degrading oxalates in the food, and fighting C. diff and reducing food allergies, um, and preventing, you know, modulating the immune system and preventing H. pylori overgrowth. I mean, the list goes on and on. Anti-inflammatory, supporting digestion and immune health. I would even see those things. There's so many amazing things that we know that the bacteria can do to assist us, but they're not going to do any of these things if we're taking a single serving of yogurt that has very low counts. It's not about taking in a yogurt and then sabotaging your diet for the rest of the day. It doesn't work that way. These organisms need to be living in and on our surfaces at all times. Okay. Um, so I, I think what happens when people hear about nutrition and they hear about the microbiome and they hear about healing is everyone hears what people are saying and then they kind of get glazed over about practically what needs to happen. Right, because everyone's probably listening to me and they're like, yeah, right, so what, what is she talking about anyway? Um, and I think the simplest way for me to explain, uh, explain it like in two just very succinct ways is that you use food to feed the microbes. There's certain types of food that actually feed and grow diversity. And then there are foods that work to literally break down pathogens and viruses that don't belong there. Does that make sense? So there's certain types of foods in nature that will go after pathogens and viruses and bacteria that are, 
are opportunistic that will look to take over your system. And then there are commensal bacteria and beneficial bacteria that are really there to assist you. And there are certain types of foods that they like to eat. Now, none of the food that's processed in garbage is even in this cap. It does, it's not even part of the discussion today. You get that, right? Yeah. Like a Dorito does nothing for you, right? You get that? It's not, we're not, we're not even taught, that's not even food. So that's not even being discussed, right? So just think about it in that those very simple terms. So when you think about fermented foods or grains or you know oatmeal that you had this morning, that wasn't really killing the pathogen, but it was feeding some mental bacteria, and they're getting hungry, and they were like nourishing them. And then you think of plants and sprouts and this beautiful pomegranate, right, and the polyphenols. And now you're thinking of these stealth fighters that are going to go in and kill pathogens and break down biofilm. Do you understand that concept? Right? It's like two different mechanisms. That's the way you have to think about it. You can think of fats and proteins and carbohydrates, wasting your time. <laughs> I mean, it's fine in the sense that you're nourishing yourself and you want a balanced diet. But you really want to think about, if you want to think about the microbiome and think about how you're really harnessing that immune system and, or, and feeding those microbes, think about it just a little bit differently than you might say today. So polyphenols, there's over 8,000 of them, they're broken down into different flavonoids, all these phenolic compounds, ligands, and they're in all these beautiful, rich, colorful foods, okay? And so some of the benefits are that they break down the biofilm in the gut. So when we have these autoimmune triggering pathogens and certain types of yeast and bacteria that can be uh, disease triggering issues, okay? Then these types of plants and fruits and vegetables can get in and break down some of that biofilm, okay? So they can really protect us and clear some of that out. In nature, um, in some of the ancient <coughs> I read very old things. Um, there was this uh, literature that talks about that uh, the plants used to use polyphenols to communicate with the animals. So when drought or changes in weather patterns were anticipated, <coughs> the plants would upregulate polyphenol compounds to set off gene conservation in the animals. In other words, when the anticipations of weather changes would happen, polyphenol content goes up animals would eat the berries and the leaves and then their gene conservation um, would kick in and they would know that they weren't going to have access to plants and berries and things for extended periods of time because the levels of polyphenol would dictate to their genes how long they were going to have to survive with the changes in the weather. So there was this incredible communication between nature and animals, okay? This is true for us. The, ant, the plants and the food is communicating with us through these compounds, through these foods. It's telling our cells and information in our body what we need to do. What do you think epigenetics is, right? It's information for our genes. The environment is turning on and off the genes, right? It's dictating whether or not we're going to have health or whether or not we're going to have disease. What do you think is doing that? we talk about the plants and the food with plants. This is the communication, this is the network. That's information in nature coming into the human body and communicating with us. This is their language. These chemical compounds is the language of the plants. It's communicating with ourselves, right? So this plays an important role. So the, the polyphenols are not just prebiotics, increasing the ratio of beneficial bacteria, but also really telling our genes and the rest of ourselves important information. This is uh, a lack, um, the elagic acid is the phenolic compound in pomegranate. And so I'm using this specific example just to isolate that yes, it can prevent the biofilm and break down existing biofilm, but also a natural antibiotic, antimicrobial, um, it's been shown to protect against UTI that's caused by E. coli to combat candida overgrowth. And then I mentioned I would go back to the form sensing. So um, the other thing I did want to point out, though, is that the pomegranate, the specific phenolic acid, also requires commensal bacteria to be present, okay? 
So there's like a tenase activity in commensal bacteria that is required. You can't just <clears throat> bring in this healthy food and not have good commensal bacteria in the gut. In order for us to benefit from the compounds in these foods, it requires the bacteria to be present in the body. So there's this relationship that has to happen. So if you bring all these healthy foods into the body and you have a sterile gut, it's very difficult for it to work with these compounds because it's really expecting that bacteria, just like in the soil, right? If you put all these wonderful things into the soil and there's no bacteria to digest, right, then you don't have any minerals because it's the bacteria that's digesting those minerals that's upregulating that through the roots and getting into the plant. That's the process. Same thing inside the human body. It's exactly the same. They have to have that commensal <clears throat> bacteria in order to make this bioavailable to us. Okay? So form sensing really is a group of bacteria that coordinate their behavior when they multiply. So when they're in isolation, they don't necessarily do anything until they become uh, multiplied in numbers. So if you haven't uh, seen Bonnie Bassler's 2009 TED Talk on how bacteria talk, I highly recommend you watch that TED Talk. Um, it's very, very fascinating what they saw in the lab when the bacteria reached a certain level. In isolation, what they did was nothing, and when they grouped together up to a certain number, what they were able to do as a community. So we have to remember that bacteria, okay, when they're in small numbers, think about those fungus and candida overgrowth and pathogens and parasites. When they're in small numbers, they do very little. When they grow and they multiply and they become a very large community, they become powerful. So our job is to keep them in very small numbers. Okay? And the commensal bacteria will do that for you. If you don't take care of yourselves and those other types of bacteria take over, and they become stronger. And that's because they're using that form sense and that way to communicate. And then they start to communicate with each other. They can do very little when they're in isolation. Okay? So it's very important that when you understand their behavior and how they work, or I can just talk about it and put it at the same for me. And then you can understand how they are not necessarily a threat until they're outnumbered. So these are examples of polyphenol. Just make sure your wine is organic if you're eating and drinking wine that's grown in California and covered in pesticides, you might as well just drink liquid poison. Um, so good quality wine, good quality teas, good quality coffee, good quality chocolate. I'm not talking about chocolate bars, I'm talking about real cacao, real chocolate, 70% chocolate. Good, I mean, really enjoy these foods, people. I mean, this is, like, the, these foods are good when they're in good quality. Okay, so go for quality and really enjoy the compounds. Um, and then not forgetting the spices and the herbs and the powerful mechanisms that exist in all of these beautiful foods and how um, powerful they are inside the body as medicinal foods, that they are available to all of us. You don't have to be eating a ton of them, <coughs> just making them available in your own cooking, just keep incorporating them into your food. Um, they are extremely medicinal. And recognizing that a diverse microbiome means a diverse diet, a diet that is full of natural foods and vegetables, fiber, sulfuric rich foods, um, you know, cruciferous vegetables, Brussels sprouts, legumes, uh, herbs, colorful, you know, onions, apples, all the pectin in the apple. If you can cook an apple um, and just enough to get that pectin to shine, you know, like a soft stewed apple. That will do so much for your microbiome more than anything else. Even leftover potatoes, if you cook um, an extra serving of potatoes at night and then refrigerate the potatoes, uh, just chilled cold potatoes, even if you reheat them in the morning as like a home fries, uh, they will feed the microbiome. So that's a wonderful thing to do with kids. Um, so there's so many easy things with real food. You don't have to overcomplicate it. Um, you just have to remember that you need to be chewing your food, if you're pureeing your food, and you're making all kinds of smoothies and protein shakes, and all of your food is real and clean, but none of it is green, and none of it is colorful, and you aren't found any fruits anymore, and nothing is fiber rich, then you're not giving those microbes anything to eat. You have to feed them. And so they need sprouts, and they need things that are dirty, nothing should be triple, quadruple washed. 
So even if you just have to grow your own herbs and your herbs are a little dirty from an organic soil, just do that at the very least. Uh, because if everything you're eating is sterile, you're not getting any soil-based organisms. And that's a problem. You know, uh, so we have to remember that our plant, use, our food used to come right from the soil and we got exposed to those organisms. Uh, and so we're really losing so much of that diversity. So in very simple terms, please just eat ingredients, don't eat food, eat ingredients. Um, when your family says there's only ingredients in here, there's no food here, you're, you're there, you've done it. Uh, that's the sweet spot. And then for the love of God, please get outside. <laughs> Did anybody see the NBC uh, thing the other day on the news? No, NBC on ecotherapy. Nobody saw that. They were prescribing <laughs> ecotherapy. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. Full segment. NBC News. Yeah, these are the criteria. You must hear birds chirping. <laughs> I, 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 was like, I almost had to pause it because I almost threw up on the kitchen. I was like, we have dumbed down the population to the point. And I honestly felt bad for this family because they went to the doctor, they had depression, anxiety. They have two children and a family, and now I'm not kidding you. They went to the family's house, they interviewed them, they went to the doctor, they went to get prescriptions for anxiety and uh, depression, and the doctor prescribed ecotherapy, it's a real thing. These are the criteria. You must see a tree, birds chirping, and stream. The family's been going multiple times, they were prescribed it, and they went back to interview the family where they reported they were feeling better and a little bit feel calmer. And I said, we have literally reached the point where we won't go outside until we get a prescription. <laughs> uh, uh, right? And that's what I'm thinking. This is like, to the point, I know, this is seriously, and I was, and my, at first my husband, and God love him, said, oh, you know, people don't understand, and I was like, bite your tongue, bite your tongue, stop it right there, right there. People absolutely know they need to go outside. Yes, they do. We need to move, we need to cook our own food, and because we really, we've reached that point where we're forgetting how to care for ourselves, right? We're forgetting how to care for ourselves. So I'm, I'm saying it, and I don't want to feel mean to the, the family who's having that suffering, but I, please, if anybody, uh, you know, just remind people of the basic principles Really, it's so, and yourself. Like, if you really start to feel disconnected, like you have to check in with yourself. Am I going outside enough? You know, and, and if somebody says your vitamin D is low, you know, you're so don't take a vitamin D supplement because you haven't left your desk in 12 hours. <laughs> it's like go outside like six times a day and then check your vitamin D levels and your cholesterol levels to make sure it's a good conversion, and then say, okay, maybe I need to supplement short term. But don't take the vitamin D supplement because you haven't left your desk for 12 hours, because that's a lifestyle problem, not a vitamin D problem, right? So we don't want to supplement our way out of a, a lifestyle problem. So just remembering to support the whole body rather than treating individual parts that everything is connected. And then some of my final thoughts, of course, that healing properties cannot be isolated to a single nutrient or compound in a food or supplement. There is a synergistic effect in nature to provide um, that speaks to the microbial world in us that we don't fully understand. So as much as I think I know um, a little bit, I think I know very little actually at all. Um, I think I'm very ignorant to what Mother Nature does and what the food does and what our bodies do. And um, I have just incredible respect for this gift and all of the gifts that Mother Nature provides to us. And so the more that I learn, the more I realize I know nothing. Right, and so I just keep on learning, and I keep I stay curious, and I keep asking tough questions of myself, and I stay open, and I say, you know, if I have the information wrong, show me, teach me, uh, because I'm open to a new way of thinking and a new way of doing, and I'm not rigid in my thinking, and if I've got it wrong, I can have to change my mind. Um, well, this group in particular, why has the word glyphosate across? Oh, thank you. Oh, so that's my entire, well, the entire film is about GMOs and glyphosate, and my entire uh, talk and discussion tomorrow on how to deal with microbiome will be outside. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Right. After lunch. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And so I'll just leave with this final thought that um, attempting to isolate the healing process, you know, often leads to imbalances and unexpected consequences. So when you try to isolate healing in one part of the body, then you generally end up playing a game of whack a mole. And so trying to heal the health of the whole is critical. And then strengthening the health of the whole body really harnesses our capacity to lead to long-term results uh, rather than disease management. Mm -hmm. So um, I thank you everybody for your patience.